this computer. Oh, okay. Uh, this is Paul, and I'm having a conversation this evening with a friend of mine that I have um, been in a strange way pen pals with for almost 20 years, but we've never actually met in person. And his name is 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 Reverend David Snapper. And I just want to appreciate you, David, for being willing to come on and talk this evening. And um, why don't well, you tell us, Paul? Why don't you tell a little bit about yourself? I know a lot of uh, a lot of the people who watch my channel are curious about church and ministry and some of these things. How did how did when did you first decide you wanted to become a pastor? Hi, Paul. I was uh, teaching school in Montana. I was um, a young man. I taught school two years. I was a math and physics student. I uh, taught chemistry, and then. Um, I was in the school and, and I uh, loved the kids and working with kids and decided that I'd heard a, a call to spend more of my time working on the spiritual life of the kids more than uh, physics and uh, geometry. Okay. So I went to school and became a pastor. And you, um, you, did, some, you did some prison ministry in Grand Rapids or something like that? That's right. Uh, I went to school for five years in Michigan. And uh, during that time, uh, I spent uh, about three years as a chaplain to a jail in the county. Um, wow. I was uh, coerced by the uh, sheriff in charge of the, of the jail. He, he cornered me with several deputies and, and, uh, and, and their guns uh, persuaded <laughs> me that, that I, I needed to be their chaplain. And that, was, <laughs> that was the end of that conversation. So uh, for about three years, I and a, another close friend were, were chaplains to uh, a group of young men who had sentences less than a year. And uh, so they'd been convicted of a, either a serious misdemeanor or minor felonies. I forget the exact details of it. But in those days, marijuana was a serious crime. And, and uh, so they would come there, nonviolent um, offenders for a sentence less than a year. And, my friend and I had the opportunity to speak to hundreds of these uh, young people as they moved through the jail system. And, and what so that was a huge part of this. And, and what, what kind of takeaway did you have from that experience? Well, I think one of the most uh, dramatic moments of my life at that point was one of the prisoners came um, up to me afterwards and he said, you know, we prayed the Lord's Prayer. And it begins, Our Father, which art in heaven. In those days, I was King James, so it went in that language. And the kid said, you know, I have a kind of hard time with that because my dad, he's an alcoholic. My mom is kind of heavy on drugs, but she buys me beer. And then my dad beats me because I'm drinking beer like he does. Wow. And it's hard for me to think God in heaven is a good idea. And I realized we had an incredible communications gap that uh, we, we really needed to, to, to cross. These young people needed some kind of hope and encouragement and, and wisdom and leadership, and they weren't finding it. Okay. So that was one of those moments that uh, really defined my growing. Okay. And then you, you went on and you planted a church up in Washington State. What was that like? Well, I was four years in Minnesota, and that was uh, like cold <laughs> and hot. <laughs> and then uh, we did come to uh, Washington State in 1984, um, and we came to a small town called Silverdale, Washington, which is the home of uh, the West Coast Trident submarine fleet, and then Naval Shipyard uh, of Bremerton. And so we were surrounded by Navy people coming and going, young families uh, in the military coming and going. We did plant a church in 1984, and I served as the pastor for 30 years. Wow. And then I, yeah, I retired in uh, 2014. And since then, I've been um, employed just variously, uh, just enjoying a variety of things. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the one of the things you did in the in the last number of recent years is you have you you wrote a a study on forgiveness and a a you know a whole course on forgiveness. What now? That obviously was after you had been a church plant for quite a while and after your experience with with prison many what ministry. What motivated you to want to write about forgiveness? 
Well, the, the, I'd like to tell you a great story, but uh, the fact is I'll, I'll just tell you the truth instead. <laughs> the, truth is that, uh, the truth is that nobody had taught me how to forgive. I've been told I need to forgive, ought to forgive, should forgive. I was told I'll feel better if I forgive, but no one told me how. And I found myself uh, three or four times in my life from my youth on up to, um, to that time, um, hurt in a very deep way at one time or another. And I, and I didn't know what to do to uh, undo the hurts that I'd experienced. So the forgiveness workshop came about, first of all, as my own need to figure out how to, to, to get past my past. And then uh, as I told my friends in the congregation what happened to me, they said, well, tell us. And so I told them and they said, well, let's tell some more people. And one thing led to another and I've been sharing this uh, uh, wonderful strategy. And so it's a great gift uh, of how to forgive uh, everywhere, um, everywhere I have the chance. Okay. okay. So that's what brings me here. Okay. Um, did, did you find in your ministry that there were a lot of people who, um, had issues with forgiveness or were, um, bound or imprisoned by bitterness of one sort or another? You know, I have said this and, and sometimes I think people don't hear this very well, but I, I really think it's true that when people harbor a hurt, they stop trusting people mm. and they stop believing people and they stop taking people seriously. They're always looking for how somebody's trying to game them or trick them or to get an advantage over them. And so imagine that you have an elder or a, a, a deacon or a leader of, of any sort and they don't trust their pastor and they just carry resentment in her or the pastor doesn't trust his leadership team because he was in a church where the leadership team cheated him. Well, it makes it just for impossible relations if we don't trust each other. So, yeah, I do. I, I, I believe it's a, a very significant factor in, um, in, the, in the well-being and in the relationships in churches and, and really everywhere, of course. Okay. So, so, what's, your, so what's, your, what's your thing here? And I think you're exactly right. I think you hear tell, you, we tell people to forgive, but I think you're exactly right. I think... Well, well, why do you think forgiveness is so hard for people? Okay, I'm, um, I didn't hear that very well, Paul. Okay. We, we a, we, why, we why, do you, why is forgiveness so difficult? You, people, people say, oh, you should forgive. I mean, C.S. Lewis had this great line that everybody thinks forgiveness is, idea, is a great idea until they actually have something to forgive. So, so why <laughs> is letting go so hard? Well, I, I, I tell you why I think it's so hard. Because when we're hurt, when we're really hurt, then we become confused. We, I, I say it this way, hurt is anything that comes into my life that changes my view about myself, my view of the rules of the world from realistic to unrealistic. And it's that unrealistic part that makes it so difficult to deal with forgiveness. I will say, have you ever heard someone say, my computer hates me? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's unrealistic. That's, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> I know there's some people from Microsoft that think that way, but but, uh, but we say this car doesn't like me, or so and so doesn't like me, and we we start to create a fantasy world based on our our hurts, and our fantasy world is designed in our minds to support our hurt view of the world. And so for people to forgive, they almost have to step outside of their own thinking for a while to, to reconsider, are the things that I believed really true or not? And that has been the most difficult starting point in, in, the, uh, in the area of forgiveness. People just so lock on to their emotion and the, um, the events that they have to, to uh, underlying those emotions, it's difficult to unwrap that. That's the challenge. But now for, you know, for example, of the, the person that you met in prison who talked about, you know, how his father was an alcoholic and his mother, you know, was a drug user and his father would beat him. I mean, that's a, that's a real hurt. 
And, and you know, when that takes up residence, especially when you're young, and especially if you've lived in that for years, that's, that's a pretty significant thing. And, you know, I can understand how, how, how someone who has had that experience now, you know, let alone being able to trust a heavenly father, but, but, but deal with people all around them. Why, why would they want to trust people? And that, I think, is precisely the problem. Once you've lo lost your trust in the rules of the world, that the rules are fair, the rules are reasonable, that you'll get a fair shake in this world, once you lose that confidence, you, your mind, your imagination can take you anywhere and you can create any kind of fantasy world you want. And that, I think, is the hardest part about forgiving. But, but you're a Calvinist pastor, right? And, and, and <laughs> yes, doesn't, don't Calvinists believe that um, people in the world do hurt us and, and aren't fair and break rules? Um, you know, maybe, they're, maybe their fear is rational because isn't this how people are? Well, that's true, right? The, the, the world is full of hurt. But they, they, come to this, they come to this problem where they believe that they're innocent because they know they didn't, this young man didn't cause this problem. But uh -huh. his, his parents did. His parents have told him all along they're right and he's wrong. And, and he can't sort all that out as a child. Or I think my first experience when I was uh, in sixth grade, I, I was a brand new kid in the school. I'd moved several times because of my father's career in the Marine Corps. I was plunked down into a, a sixth grade class in the middle of the year. Five minutes later, the teacher dragged me out of the class by the back of the neck and yelled at me up one side and down the other outside the hallway, brought me back into the class, tears running down my face. And I didn't know how to assimilate that kind of experience. Okay. My brain at age 12 couldn't figure that out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I told people and I said, this wasn't right. And they would say to me, no, it's okay. It's okay. Just consider the source. Let bygones be bygones. Get over it. Well, it took me 17 years to get over that kind of hurt. And it created a lot of trouble for me in my life. Okay. So, so what did you do? What did you do? What did I do? Yeah. I, how well, how I did you get rid of this hurt? Well, that was not a good one because it took me a long time and I went a lot of places I shouldn't have gone. <laughs> but, uh, well, isn't that, isn't that what everyone does? I mean... Well, it is. Yes, it is. It is. I mean, right. So I think my story is typical. I don't think my story is atypical. And I got into a lot of trouble. I think it was the cause for me being kicked out of school a time or two and uh, doing poorly at, at school. And, and Wait, I, I thought pastors were perfect people and never did anything wrong. And that's why you get a, you're allowed to be a pastor. Now you're telling me something different. Yes. That you were a troublemaker. That's exactly right. Yes, Paul, I was, uh, I did suffer. I, I had, uh, I, I say it was like the, uh, the events steal a part of your life. Hmm. And my belief that my teacher loved me and trusted me and was looking out for me and he believed me, all of that belief about the rules of the world was changed in an instant. My belief about myself, that I was an okay little kid, just a normal little Calvinist kid, doing fine and God was looking out for me and my mom and dad were looking out for me. Everybody was on my side. That was gone in 10 seconds. Wow. And I believed five minutes later that I would never have a friend again. I was so humiliated and embarrassed that I thought it would be impossible to get past that event. And like I say, it took me 17 years. So I was 29 when I got through it. And, and, and this is, you know, and, you know, again, a lot of people think that pastors live lives wrapped in bubble wrap and we're somehow uh, unaware of the bad things that happen in the world. And they don't understand that people drag themselves into our office and vomit the, the most painful, worst things of their lives, you know, onto the table in front of us and say, here, pastor, you sort this out. And um, <laughs> I mean, in your story, I, I don't want to minimize, I don't want to minimize your story, but you and I have both heard stories of, you know, the kind of pain that is, that is just unimaginable. And, and yes. it's commonly out there. My story, I tell it 
I, sometimes I do this in a workshop and I tell my story and I tell it because it's so small. I mean, really, I, my sixth grade teacher yelled at me unfairly. I mean, really, come on, get over it, buddy. <laughs> that, is, that is pretty small. That is pretty small potatoes compared to what happens to some people. Yeah. But for me, it, it, it destroyed my belief and convictions about myself and the world. Mm -hmm. And once I learned how to get through this, I decided I wanted to help other people who are in a similar kind of situation that might not know how to get through this. Because I told a lot of people and I was asking for help and people just didn't take it seriously. And it was, it was painful. I wanted to do what I could do to, to show someone else how to get through it. Okay, okay. So is, is this where the bucket comes in? Tell me about the bucket. Because you said, oh, you know, okay. it's a forgiveness thing, but it has to do with a bucket. And I thought, well, that must be some bucket to deal with hurts and those kind of things. <laughs> Well, let me, let me give you a little story first. Okay. Um, Linda Ronstadt sang a song, Silver Threads and Golden Needles Cannot Mend This Heart of Mine. I remember. And she sang about the tragedies of her love life. And, and she could have this wonderful mansion on a hill, but if her heart was broken, nothing else was good enough. Yeah. And so even silver thread with a golden needle couldn't fix the terror in her heart. And that was true for, for me, and it's been true for, for many of us. So let me give you a story here. I'm sitting in my office now, well, 10, 12 years later uh, ago from now, and uh, a, a young girl came in, a high school girl. I supervised community service all through my career. Girl came into my office and, and she said, uh, I have community service to do, appointed by the court, by my, by my uh, parole officer. He sent me over here to do community service. And I said, great, how many hours do you have to do? And she said, oh, I have 60 hours worth of work to do. I said, great, what'd you do? She said, well, I was shoplifting. And I said, 60 hours for shoplifting, what'd you shoplift? <laughs> and she says, well, <laughs> well that, that junk jewelry, you know, uh, from Kohl's. And I said, that's a lot of hours. She said, well, it's the third time. I said, oh, why did you shoplift? What were you thinking? She said, I hate my mother. I said, hate your mother? She says, why do, you, I, why do you hate your mother? She says, she drove my father away. And I said, he drove your father away. What do you mean? She says, my father and mother had a fight. And my father went to live with his girlfriend in Arizona. And he loves his girlfriend more than he loves me. Mm -hmm. So I hate my mother. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can fill up the empty space in my life is to steal stuff. And I tell you, it, the first time I heard that sort of thing, I was just absolutely blown away. And I had a bucket. I'm back to the bucket now. And okay. you can see it here, I hope. Yep. Um, this is your it's just an ordinary gallon. bucket. There's nothing magical about the bucket. You got it at just home. A rabbit. <laughs> just a rabbit in here. Well, what I found was, was that people carry this bucket and it's full of things. Now, I'm not going to try to tip it over, but my bucket is full of the time I didn't measure up <laughs> and I carry that and I go down the street and people duck and if you've been to a jail prison, you know that everybody's been framed and people carry these things and somebody else here see I don't know if you can see my, my, my cheesy little props here but people give me the brush off and uh, <laughs> You, you know, you could have had a career as a as a White House, um, you know, uh, press press agent or something with all the props. Um, although that guy's out of work now, so I, I don't go into yeah. <laughs> Well, I've got a box. I've got a box full of these things here. The latest one of them is I was at a church yesterday or two days ago preaching, and I I stole one of their mugs by accident. <laughs> And now, and now it's in my bucket, and I'm feeling guilty about it, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> well, here's, here's the deal. People get hurt, and they lose their dad, or they lose their mom, they lose their job. And instead of this grand landscape of the way their life should have been, there's a hole right where their job should have been, or their daddy should have been, or the mommy should have been, or or whatever they lost, there's a big hole. And I use this bucket to symbolize that. And what we'll do is fill 
this empty spot in our lives with anything. Bad memories, hurts. We'll try to put money in there. We'll try to put girlfriends in there, boyfriends in there. We'll try to put jobs in there. We'll do whatever we can do. But this bucket gets heavy. And we carry around with us for years. I mean, I, I'm the, you know, the poster child for mismanagement here. But for 17 years, I carried my bucket full of hurt with me. I don't know if you can see the, the padding here. Yeah. And that represents how we try to pad the weight so it doesn't cut into our fingers. And we give classes on anger management and coping skills. And I'm saying, how dumb is that? Why do we manage our anger? Why not try to make it go away? That's a way better way to deal with our hurt. So the first time I use my bucket, I'm in the jail. And I give it to a young man. And I start filling it up with heavy weights. And pretty soon this guy's straining. And I know I'm going to beat him. Because I tell him, I'm a preacher and I can preach forever. And he can't hold it as long as I can talk. <laughs> They're in the chapel. And there's all these young men watching. This great big man holding this bucket. And his finger or his hands start trembling and his fingers and he twirls and he holds it over his shoulder and back and i realize that one more rock and he's going to fall down or he's going to drop it yeah and i can't because i can go home and that man's gonna have to face everybody else if he's weak and what i've learned over 40 some odd years with a bucket no one has ever put the bucket down no one has ever gotten up from the audience to help the guy who's struggling and no one holding the bucket has asked for help we will let our arms fall out of our sockets but we won't ask for help and we won't help somebody in pain it's a crazy thing now i know people do help i'm, I'm exaggerating but but the concept i've watched mothers with tears running down their faces as their child's holding the bucket in desperate pain, and mom will sit there and not get up and help her child <laughs> <laughs> in public. Okay, so there's the bucket, and that's what hurt does to us. And we need to empty that bucket out and fill it with something better instead of something awful. So so how do you so okay, let me let me see if I get this straight. So the bucket represents so when when someone hurts us, it, it creates kind of a hole in us. And we feel that emptiness. We feel that hole. And so then we try to stuff it with things. And, and, we, right. and, and I, we usually stuff it with, we stuff it with things that we think are going to be meaningful to us. We maybe stuff it with things that are going to distract us. We maybe stuff it with things that are going to give us short-term pleasures. But we try to fill that hole and we, we keep putting stuff in it. It gets heavier and heavier. And, and it gets harder and harder to manage in your life. And, and so what I guess I hear you exactly. saying is, well, I would, I would extrapolate on this a little bit that, you know, that I bet you if you have somebody holding that bucket in the jail, you try and talk to them. And, and the longer they hold that bucket, the crankier they get. And the, um, you know, because they're all they're doing is thinking about that darn bucket. And so people around them become more and more irritating to them. And it, it starts to, I mean, I could imagine that starts to take out their life. So they've got, they've got all this stuff in the bucket and, and they, well, they don't even know they, I mean, they, they have a hurt, but they probably don't connect that hurt with the hole or the stuff that they've put in it, right? Well, that's one of the, the real problems of it. It confuses us. Remember that first definition is hurt confuses us. Okay. And you're right. They, they don't make all the connections. And pretty soon the whole world is hurt. Yeah. The whole world is unfair. Yeah. And they spend their whole life getting ahead, getting rich, getting back, getting even. But there's adrenaline, there's power, there's dynamic. Some people love to feel like victims and other people like to feel like they're aggressors. And it, it, it takes a hundred shapes and forms. But one way or another, a lot of us spend our time trying to fill up that empty spot to compensate for what we lost. So, so what and brings people to want to deal with this bucket and to actually even see the bucket? What, 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 what causes that? Well, sometimes there, so, what causes them to, to be willing to look in their own bucket? Yeah. Sometimes it gets so heavy, they break. They, their arms just fall off holding the bucket. 
or their kid runs away from home and gets in trouble and they say, what have I done wrong? Well, there's 101 things that will bring the po person to that point. And because I had huge interest in helping myself and then secondly, helping other people once I figured it out, I realized how long a process it is. You can't just have, walk up to someone and say, hey, I think we're going to dump out your bucket. Life's going to be good and, you know, have a nice life. You know, <laughs> they've spent 20 years filling this bucket and nurturing it, caring for it. Their life becomes built around this hurt. And so, I, I, I mean, I'm sitting at a table with a woman who is older than I am. She was probably 80. And she said to me after the end of a workshop, she said, I've never told this to anybody before, but at age 10, I was molested. Mm. And I've carried that in my bucket for 70 years or whatever the exact time was. And it's just been way down in the bottom and everywhere I go, it's there. When I get up in the morning, when I go to bed at night, I know what happened. I don't tell anybody and nobody knows. And I said, we have to empty that out and get that out of there. And uh, I'm glad to tell you that that's exactly what happened that day because she was able to tell about it for the first time and stop being afraid of it. Okay. And she started the process of emptying the hurt out of her bucket. So, Paul Turnier, the great, the great uh, Swiss psychiatrist, would say that hurt is the emotion that doesn't self-heal. If you're happy, if you go to bed happy at night, you're, there's no guarantee you'll wake up just laughing and giggling in the morning. You can wake up cranky in the morning, but if you go to bed cranky, chances are you're going to wake up cranky because cranky doesn't go away. It sits in the bottom of the bucket and it'll stay there a long time. So, so okay. So, how do you get the hurt out? Now, this this woman she had to talk about she had to talk about what had happened to her when she was a child. What you I mean? Because you got a church full of people. I mean, are you do you kind of play therapist to these people, or how does this work? Well, it, it's, it's, it, you want to be careful about this, of course, because you can't, you can't spend your time being the junior therapist, but uh, I do workshop and that helps. Okay. Um, so, here, so I go through four steps. Okay. And would you like to hear the four steps? Yes, please. Okay. So number one, and so for, for everyone who's listening, I, I hope you give this a, a try. My goal was to make the Betty Crocker version of forgiveness it's not a wedding cake. It's not a, a birthday cake. It's just any old cake, but it's going to work to the best of my ability. And that's my absolute conviction and, and, and commitment is I want everybody to have a chance to forgive. It's the best gift that you can have. So anyway, I'm going to put my bucket down for a minute here. Number one, what am I angry about in 10 words or less? What makes me mad? What did I lose? What did someone steal from me? So if I don't use the bucket, I can use the image of the Grand Canyon. You're standing there looking out the landscape and all of a sudden there's this gigantic hole. Somebody took all that dirt away. Where did it go? And that's what I'd like to ask everybody. If you're one of the hurt people in the world, what did you lose? Can you say it in 10 words or less? Your innocence your naivete, your job, your spouse, your money, your whatever it is, what can you say is what you lost? The secondly, what have you put into your bucket to compensate for what you've lost? Mm -hmm. Busyness, jobs, activity, clothes, shopping, abusing people, letting people abuse you. You do something to compensate for what you have lost. Now that's the, the first step, what it is that you lost and what did you do to replace it with something else that was a substitute. Number two, what's it worth to you what you lost? The grammar of that wasn't very good, but I think the concept's okay. What was the value of what you lost from your life. If a child was stolen from you, that's an enormous loss. If you lost a job, that could be an enormous loss. If 
for me in sixth grade, I lost my dignity and my pride. It wasn't very much in one sense, but it was the only dignity and pride I had. <laughs> and I didn't have a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I was I was done. I was done at age 12. My life was over, I had decided. <laughs> so so um so the second question I want to ask you you ask you is what is the value of what you lost? Now people say I tried to forgive but it didn't work. Well, I want you to take the risk and do something that's very very difficult. Put a dollar amount on what you lost. Hmm. Now, Peterson says we need these old Bible accounts because they're part of our cultural evolutionary Jordan, uh, Jordan history. Jordan and you're talking about Jordan Peterson. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and so from the little I know that what you've said, he says we need these. And Well, one of those that comes to us is nearly um, uh, 3,500 years old. It goes like this from the book of Exodus, chapter 22. It says, if I steal your cow, I owe you five cows. If I steal your sheep, I owe you four sheep. God wasn't afraid to put a price tag on her. Hmm. Five cows. I steal your cow and I have your cow for dinner. Five cows makes us good. Four sheep makes us good. Now, why four sheep and five cows? I don't know. <laughs> that's just the way it was, right? Maybe, <laughs> who knows? But that's the way it was. When another character in the Bible decided to repent of his sins, he told Jesus, his name is Zacchaeus. He said, I'll take everything I have. Half of it, I'll give away. Because this guy was a crook. He, he was a Roman tax collector and uh, corrupt and dishonest. He says, every, half of what I own, I'll give away. Of everything that I've stolen, I'll give back four times to the people I stole it from. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house because this is the son of Abraham. Well, what's going on there is that this man is coming back and saying, I'm wrong. I need to repent and I need to be forgiven. And the way God says to forgive is to give back four times everything I stole. And Jesus says, good enough. Because you have to know the value of what you lost. It's really hard to forgive if, if you don't know what it is. Okay. So here's what I do. I do this a couple ways, and in the workshop, we've got an hour or two to work on this, so it's a little more fun. But if you're watching, here, try this. What would you give if you were standing in front of the judge of a court, and the judge says, okay, what would you like in order to uh, compensate you for all your claims that, uh, for the damages done to you? And you take this amount, I'll give you whatever you want, and then you'll drop your charges against the person who hurt you what would that amount be? Would you settle for a hundred bucks or a thousand or 5,000 or 10,000? Hmm. What number would you take? Hmm. That's what we're talking about here. Hmm. How much is your life worth? How much was your view of yourself and your view of the world that was twisted around by that event worth to you? Here's another way to do count what it's worth because I, I really believe that because I came from math and physics that counting really matters and, and Exodus tells us it does matter five cows four sheep numbers matter I say how many hours have you thought about your hurt in the past 30 years hmm. and if it's a really hurt person they'll tell you I don't ever stop thinking about it Wow. I wake up in the morning and I get in the shower and I look around the shower and I look for who's there. I get in my car and I wonder who's there to hurt me. Rules of the world view of myself. I'm weak and I'm unable. I can't stop this. I'm going to be hurt no matter what I do because people know me as a victim. Whatever I do, I'm going to fail at. Okay. What's your time worth? Mm, $20 an hour. Let's just say because I can multiply 20 pretty easily. Times. 10 hours a day that I'm awake. So $200 a day is my loss times 300 days a year, 7,000 some odd dollars a year times 30 years. Now I've lost the numbers in my head. Now we're gonna multiply it times four. 
now what is that hurt worth? Okay. And you're going to come up with a huge number. People object and say, oh, you can't do that because you can't put a price on that. And I say, well, what would you give to make it so it never happened? And they will say, I would give everything I own to undo the hurt that happened to me. Huh. Right? That's what hurt is. Now, not everybody's hurt like that. But that's the people I want to talk to. And here's what I want to say. You'll never be able to fill that hole with synthetic replacements, with money, cars, you name it, pity, whatever you try, it won't be enough. You will spend your whole life trying to fix what can't be broken. And that gives us to point number uh, three. Remember the bucket, and I, I'm saying, this guy's holding the bucket and his fingers are about to come out of the sockets. Here's my bucket, back, back on the screen. Do I have to pay this guy union wages? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, Isaiah, in one of those great stories that it formed our cultural heritage, says, there will come someone who will carry our infirmities, uh, he will take up our infirmities and carry our sorrows. Nobody ever puts the bucket down, nobody asks for help, and nobody gets up and helps fill in the Grand Canyon or help carry the bucket. But what if somebody came along who was good enough that they would carry the bucket with you or take it from you? That's the only way to get rid of this kind of bucket. You can't hold it forever. It will just wear you out. It will ruin your life. But if somebody takes it from you, then you have a chance. And so I'm a Christian pastor, and I, I, I've talked to so many kids in jail and adults and, and uh, people, and, and it just doesn't occur to us very quickly that we don't have to carry all this, and we aren't going to get compensated. We're the person who hurt you once will hurt you again. They're not going to give you the $10 million that you deserve because they went off to Arizona to live with their girlfriend. They're not going to come back and make your life right. They didn't care the first time. They're not going to come back short of a miracle. What you can do is forgive. And forgiveness means that I will bulldoze all the bad memories and the bad behaviors out of my life, and I'll send them far away from me. I'll make a decision to stop doing the self-destructive things that happen. And again, I, I, I'm seeing your lobster behind you and uh, remembering Jordan Peterson. And, and if I understand right, he, he's talking to people who are living in the, the basements of their mom's homes. And he's saying, you got to get up and you got to do stuff, right? You got to clean your room. You get, clean your room, clean bucko. Your room. <laughs> yeah, go clean your room, right? That's it. Yeah, so one, you you start there in your room. Start start with something you can manage. Start with a room. Okay, so clean your room. And when you've done that, then let's address all those hurts that paralyze us. They just stop us from going forward because we're, we're, we believe we're unable to stop the hurts. So let me go back to sixth grade. Why did it take me so long to forgive my sixth grade teacher? I thought I was mad at him. I wasn't mad at him. I thought I was mad at my mother and father. I wasn't mad at him. I thought I was mad at the school, the, princ the, princ uh, the principal of the school. I wasn't mad at the principal. I was devastated to realize that I was so insignificant mm. that I couldn't stop them from treating me badly. Mm. And that was a hard thing to come to terms with, that I am not as strong and smart and powerful and capable as I would like to think. I have to have the courage to do things that are frightening and difficult and that I will fail at. But the one thing I can start with to clean my room, to clean my spiritual room and to empty my bucket and say, I'm not going to go back there 
and live anymore. I'm going to bulldoze that stuff out of my life and I'm going to fill it with something good and pure to replace what I lost with something good and pure. So if, if, if um, and this is now number four. So number three is I'm going to stop focusing on my heart. I'm just going to, I'm going to stop making it the center of my life. It is the sun of my solar system. And it happens so fast. It happened to me five minutes. I'm gonna make that sun go away. And I'm gonna replace my, that old sun with something pure and true and lovely. And I'm gonna let that be the center of my life and fill my bucket. So number three is get rid of my focus on my hurts. And then number four is to replace that hurt with something lovely and true and good. So as a Christian pastor, I think if I've lost a brother, if my brother's treated me badly, could it be that there is a brother who's perfect and good and could come in and fill that place in my life, that role in my life? Is there somebody who could be a new father to me? Is there somebody who could come in and give me a new spirit in my life. And I'm saying that's the Christian message, right? That there's a God who doesn't just love us and think nice thoughts about us and send us Hallmark cards, but he really came down to die because when you're really hurt, the only thing that's good enough for the price to pay the price of the hurt is hurt. Only hurt can pay for hurt. Hmm. And he came to die for us, to carry our hurt, to carry our bucket, and to find that empty spot in our life and fix it, mm -hmm. and to fill it with his own goodness. And so the fourth stage of hurt is to fill the empty spot with the good things of God that don't ruin us and wear us out. It's not perfect. I wish I wish it had never happened in sixth grade. You know, <laughs> it took a lot from me in my life to have that happen. On the other hand, I wouldn't undo it at this point hmm. because it made me the character that I am. Hmm. And I can help somebody else and I can find the peace and the healing that I've looked for, not the way I wanted it, not the way I wanted it to happen, but it's good enough in a broken world. And we are Calvinists and it is a broken world. And it's not, <laughs> it's not just not quite as good as it ought to be, it's broken. But there in that brokenness, I found reconciliation and restoration. Right. So if in your experience of doing this seminar, what, what kinds of things have people told you about? What have they, what have they learned in this and what, what new things have they done? Because you mentioned you've got to fill it with something. And, you know, the, the, the difficulty is that, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And so if you just decide, well, here's this, here's this negative stuff that I'm doing. I'm not going to play computer games 10 hours a day. I'm, you know, what does that look like? Well, the first thing that people ask, and this is, I, you know, you hear things after a while and you realize it's, it's, it's common. I say, uh, what will you do? And they say, I don't know what I'll do with all my spare time now. Hmm. They, they literally are suddenly aware that they have been investing a great deal of their time in fussing about what's gone wrong complaining, whining, fighting, arguing, just filling themselves with emotion-filled, adrenaline-filled events to keep them from seeing what's really bothering them. And take all that away. It's like a whole new life comes in front of them. They have to repopulate their, their world. I wish I'd spend, in the times I've done this, this workshop, more time on step four because hmm. it it's harder than it looks 
hmm. to rebuild the world. Because if you really believe that you're broken and the rules of the world are broken and you have an unreal view of the world, it's really hard to straighten that back out and suddenly everything's okay. Because you're, you, 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 if you've been relying on alcohol for 20 years, you think that way. And it takes a long time to rebuild a realistic view of the world. Okay. So that's what I would do. I tell you, I, my favorite one was uh, a, a guy had uh, cost, uh, he'd lost about $100,000 in a, in a legal battle that he probably was innocent of. And uh, so he came to the end of, of this and he looked at me and he says, you know, I'm going to forgive him. But could I kill him first? <laughs> that was one of my very favorites. But, you know, people now. But what that means is people can joke about it. It's yeah. now okay. Yeah. The emotional level has gone down. The drama has gone down. The weight of the bucket, and they're okay. Do you think people need to hear permission to let go of these claims and grievances that they have, even for people who are, who are dead? I mean, is, I mean, that seems, there seems to be something to that, that there's people, people imagine that, you know, somehow they're holding justice together in the universe. Okay, I lost a little bit of your, your voice there. Do they need my permission? Well, it sounds like they need someone to give them permission to let go of their claim. Because okay, they... Could you try that again? I, I lost that on it's, that. It seems like it's... I think, I think people seem to need... Have someone give them permission to let go of their claim. That they imagine that the justice of the universe is dependent upon them to hold the, these claims against people. Even people who are long dead. You know, I, in, the, in the workshop that I did, I, I have a, a little, little action step on that area. I, I tell you, I am, I'm deeply concerned for that exact question because many people believe they must not forgive because then justice would be subverted, the world would come to an end as we know it, and they would lose terribly because the other person got away with it. And I just can't tell you how much I disagree with that. Yeah. I, I just think that is so wrong. When you forgive, you will find yourself, if your experience is at all like mine, my several experiences, you will find yourself doing the very thing that God did when he forgave us, right? He didn't forgive us because we were perfect. He forgave us when we couldn't, figure it out on our own when we wouldn't we, we're running and rebellious he forgives us so just imagine a little imagination game is god sitting up there in heaven and saying oh there's there's dave snapper boy i'm, I'm just gonna have so much fun i'm gonna crush that sucker i'm gonna find him one day and i'm gonna make him hurt so bad it's gonna be so good and justice will be served mm. no no, that's, that's monstrous, right? If we forgive, we experience the greatest gift of the world that I am so confident in my relationship to God that I don't need to hurt somebody else or get justice or revenge hmm. in order to be okay. Yeah. Now, justice happens that, you know, this passage from Exodus we read earlier, the village gets justice. That's why we have county sheriffs. And if the county sheriffs and the city sheriffs don't get it together, then God's going to have justice. Yeah. What we do in forgiving is say, I am not going to try to be God. And I'm going to let the other people do their job. And I will forgive and go on my way because I know I'm okay with God. I... Well, I'm, I'm sorry for people who feel like they need to keep going after justice. I think they are pushing it too hard and they hurt themselves in the process. Yeah. Miroslav Volf, who uh, lived through the, you know, the dissolution of the old Yugoslavia, um, you know, has written quite a few interesting books. And one of the points that he made is that 
you know, if there is no God, then suddenly you or us collectively, but in this world, suddenly we are kind of like justice's backstop. And, and so I wonder, you know, I wonder how that works mentally for people. If there is no God, then, then, then I have to hold this against my father, even if my father is dead or, or he gets away with it. But if there's a God, you can say, you know what? I, I am not God and what was done to me was wrong. I am incapable of, of making them pay the thousands or millions of dollars that they owe me, but it is also completely counterproductive. They, they, they win twice if I hold on to this. But if there is a God, Precisely. if there is a God, then actually there can be justice someday. I don't if know. I, to I totally agree. If I hold on to it, I lose twice. Yeah. And that's why the definition is so important at the start of this. Hurt is anything that changes my view of myself and the rules of the world from realistic to unrealistic. When I stop believing that there's a realistic world out there, when there are rules, when there's right and wrong, then anything goes. Mm -hmm. I can become a law to myself. I can become chaotic. I can be random, self-destructive. I can, anything goes. But if I know that there's a God and there are rules to the world, suddenly everything else can fall into place and I can be at peace. So to me, that was huge in my life. Yeah. Well, and I think that that gets, that goes along with a lot of Jordan Peterson stuff too, because even though, you know, I have some, I'm still trying to figure out, I think Jordan Peterson's still trying to figure out exactly the con, the contours of his God. Um, if, if, if you don't have, if we don't have that layer above us, then we're it. And, we do a we this this is too much to hold we we don't do this well and and it screws us up and i i see you know it, again in my ministry i'll i'll see people try to try to manage this stuff and i watch them and i just want to say you know just just let it go just just let it go but they can't and and yeah. and they literally kill themselves. You know, I, I have, you know, a lot of homeless people and, you know, a lot of them have substance abuse issues. And I, 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 I watch them drink themselves to death. And it's such a waste. With, with alcohol, you can at least see it. Yeah. But with hurt, it comes wrapped so piously. <sighs> I am such an innocent victim. And everything I do is good. And everything everybody else does in the whole world is bad. And I alone am innocent. You know, it's, it's an addiction too. Yeah. It, it, it's as powerful as any other addiction because it lives on the, um, on the uh, hormones of the body that race through our bloodstream and make us feel excited and right and superior. Yeah. And um, forgiving takes away the fear of facing the world. And it means that I can look at my world honestly and truly and not be afraid. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's, and, that's beautiful. So you've done a whole course on this and I, I can put in the notes. Now, Dave and I are from the same denomination and Dave talked about this and then he worked with some people at the denomination and you actually, this thing is actually packaged and Pastors can run it in churches and people can do it by themselves too, or how does that work? How does that package work? That's correct. It is um, available from Faith Alive Resources. Um, and if you look up, uh, I happen to be looking at the only copy I have of, um, can I, I feel like one of those cheesy infomercials. And, and I, I'm going to give you a set of Ginsu steak knives. <laughs> it says, uh, it, it won't photograph well because the, uh, the colors are so shiny. Oh, okay. But it's called Unhurt, the uh, healing power of forgiveness. It's got a little bucket on it. And then my name, David Snapper. And you can get that from Faith Alive. And if you work at it, sometimes you can get it from Amazon. Okay, okay. So, okay, there it is. Or you can put the information on, or they can email me, whatever you'd like. I, I'm just very committed to um, helping people to forgive. Okay. And now, now David is retired now, and I am not. So if you want to 
get David's email address, email me, and I'll shoot it to him. And he's got all the time in the world to answer all of your yeah. questions. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Fill my bucket. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I, I really appreciate this. At some point in the future, um, I'm going to do some more videos. Like a lot of my videos now have been around about Jordan Peterson. I'm also going to do some more videos about stuff in my denomination. And David and I have some other conversations we want to do about that. But we're going to do that in a different video at some point. But I really appreciate, David, your, your, willingness, to, your willingness to talk about this and to share yourself and to, and to share your stories. It's, 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 I really appreciate it. I am so grateful for the opportunity. And, and uh, again, it's my hope that there's somebody out there who is as, as, as struggling as much as I was, that this will give them some kind of hope and, and direction that, that there is a way out of the, um, out of the great hurt of, of losing. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And just stay right there, David. I'm going to end the recording right now.